Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to How to Win at Chess. This is a weekly series now on the Gotham Chess YouTube channel where I play against my subscribers in 10 minute rapid chess games and I walk you through the opening, middle game, and end game as I go up the rating ladder. This is episode number 28 and today we've got a really strong episode. The lowest rated player is actually 1300. So we already begin at the intermediate level and we will be ending at 2300 rapid rating. Uh, and as always, in the words of the uh, great Ernie Johnson, fantastic sports broadcaster, this series is unsullied by sponsorship since 1989. Now I haven't been alive since 1989, so let's just say 2024. But I will say, if you like anything you see in today's uh, episode, my book is literally named after this series called How to Win at Chess. Uh, that's for people who are rating uh, 0 to 1200. But also for clicking on this video, you will get a secret discount code for any of my courses just for the next 24 hours. All right? And that code is SPRING. The code SPRING will get you 33% off any course on my website, Chessly. That is my course's website. Uh, if I play anything in today's video that you like, whether it's a Scandinavian, a Carl Kahn, uh, you can check out a Middle Games Masterclass, a Tactics Masterclass, End Games. I have, I have it all. So... Uh, I've got to sponsor myself, right? I feel like I should. It's okay to sponsor myself. I'll tell you, if you like my instructional content, you enjoy watching 90-minute chess videos, uh, maybe you will enjoy some of my, you know, other content. Um, here we go. Uh, we're kicking things off today with a matchup against a 1,300-rated subscriber whose username is Solace of the Stream. Uh, and uh, here we go. I, I really enjoy this series, actually. Let me know if you enjoy this series. Um, and we will start right away with the Gotham Scandinavian. Now, a very quick point. All the courses that I have, have free samples. So at least you can test them out and see for yourself. Uh, I have been really, really enjoying my time playing the Scandinavian Defense. Uh, I, I have found that it is one of the easiest openings to play, even at my level, which is 2400 rapid, but even at 2700 blitz, like I'm loving life. And this is the main line. My opponent has played the most popular move. One of the reasons I really love the Scandinavian is it's forcing. It forces opponents to play into something that right away is on your terms, right? So the way my opponent has played this, this position is going to happen in about 90% of your games. And the opponent will develop the knight and also probably develop this pawn here. So I develop my knight. And um, yeah, bishop c4 is normal, but like at some point they have to play this move. Uh, technically here, the... The most accurate move is to pin the knight because white has not really committed this pawn. But I'm just going to show you what happens if you just play this opening the way it's kind of supposed to be played. Uh, my opponent has played the pawn to d3, which is just a touch more passive. Right? And probably they're going to go bishop d2, which is very normal. Or not. And we, when the pawn is on d4, really what I like to do is I like to move my bishop to the b4 square. Uh, and then I like to capture this knight. That is actually a little bit less powerful right now. That is the way my Scandinavian uh, generally goes. The reason why this is not a particularly good move right now is because when the bishop comes there and ultimately lands on the c3 square when this trade happens, the white pawn is not here. And then that bishop on the c3 square will be a lot more powerful uh, on that diagonal. Is it like the worst thing in the world? Not really, but generally the best way to play, if you're not going to play the Scandinavian with a bishop to before, my opponent is just just rattling off these moves, uh, is to play c6, e6, and kind of play like this. And, I, and I'm just going to play this very, very standard, basic Scandinavian. Uh, there is no attack on my knight, but this is a very common move that people play in the Scandi. Uh, I'm just going to finish up my development, make sure I'm not blundering anything, and I'm rock solid, right? And if my queen was ever to put, be put in any danger, I would slide the queen back to c7, and I would be very happy. H3 is nothing wrong with this move. I was even thinking to play bishop g4. I think before we get into a big fight, before we do anything else, why don't we just finish up our development, right? We haven't gotten all the pieces out yet. Scandinavian is a little bit passive, with the knight and bishop here not traditionally standing on the most active squares. Also a little bit passive with these two pawns. They're not really on the fifth rank, but they are springboard pawns. Right? They support other pawns to advance into the position uh, and to potentially cause some problems. Now, I was thinking to play this move h6. A very common question in chess is like, is that sacrifice a thing, h6, and your opponent can sacrifice the bishop for two pawns? It does look a little bit dangerous, I have to say. It might be not the most pleasant thing in the world. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't see anything wrong with this move b5. 
And I feel like at this level, this is a very standard, you know, natural kind of follow-up. And now the bishop has to slide back. When we put the bishop there, I'm looking at two things. Number one, I'm looking to chase it down with pawns and trap it. That's the first thing I'm looking for. The second thing that I'm looking for is to potentially just trade it off, right? And so I don't really want to trade it off. I feel like that's just relieving white of pressure. Uh... And not to mention the fact that then I'm just going to be attacked here. I think my queen has sort of served the purpose. So I could just slide back. Like I could just go back to the c7 square here or b6. Very tough to say. Or d8. Right. But let's just, you know, let's just go back to the c7 square and we're preparing this advance. Now I do have to speed up. Of course, I'm, I'm trying to be instructive. Um, and uh, that's why I'm obviously playing a bit slowly. When we move our queen to a square like this, we do have to think about the whole time, we're going to be thinking about what does our opponent want? Okay, our, I mean, clearly our opponent wants the bishop. One thing you have to realize here is you are protected, but there's a rook on the other side of the board, and you, you just got to look. You got to look on the other side. You got to see what does this rook see. So our options are get out of the way with the bishop or potentially bring the bishop right back here. Me personally, I like the bishop on that square, and we're taking toward the center to make sure we're still protected here. And we have a rock-solid formation near our king. That was not a bad trade for white. It's a completely reasonable trade. And now we have to kind of figure out what's next, right? What is next in this position? Well, we've traded our light-squared bishop. So just a rule of friendly, friendly piece of advice. After that, you should probably keep as many pawns on light squares as possible. Uh, remember, this was our plan. It's not really the best plan, but I'm going to just justify it because that's why I did that. And now we're trying to just hunt our opponent down with our queenside pawns. Probably for white, white should strike back. Uh, A3 is fine, but it's very passive. This is a pure strike back kind of a move. Our options are ignore, but that would lose a pawn. Uh, push, which makes the knight move. Uh, take, which I don't like because it splits our pawns. Or just protect. You know, it, if, we t if we push, we have to be certain that there's a follow-up. And then the knight's going to go to the middle. What's the follow-up? A lot of people would play here, though. But I think at this level, it is actually important to kind of learn these little, like, moments of maybe pushing. I don't know. Let's, let, I feel like for this level, pushing is exactly what would happen. And now white is going to go here, and we're going to take. And then our bishops are going to stare at each other. My opponent's actually playing great. Like, this is... So far, the position is quite equal. I, I, I will need to start uh, having to put my foot on the gas a little bit. Otherwise, you know, this is not going to be... I'm going to leave myself with no time at the end. Um, now, again, here I'm, I, I am protected. It's a very balanced game. Um, I can take. I can ignore. I can try to bring a rook to the center. There's a lot of possibilities. Uh, I, I, I do feel like people would be relieving themselves of, of the tension here a bit. But... There is no, you know, exact reason to do that. So I'm going to put my rook in the center. And sometimes people people ask, like, how do you know which rook should go to the center or not? Uh, very tough question. The truth is, like, I, I wouldn't move that rook to that square because then I would be weakening my king a bit. But maybe, maybe that was the right decision, you know? Right now, a very curious idea by my opponent is bishop takes knight which is generally not what you want to give away, but then to try to put the knight on g5. So, for example, bishop takes. If I take back with the knight, put the knight on that square. Okay, bishop Bishop there is a, uh, is a fine move. Uh, my original idea here was just simply to slide my queen to the b6 square. Uh, e5 is okay, but it opens up that bishop. It might not be the... I mean, I could play e5. And then maybe I can take and I can go trade that bishop. Like, that, that, that is a possibility. Um... You know what? Let's just let's let's just show it. Let's just show it. Let's just show it. The reason why e5 is not the best move, you see, I'm opening up that bishop. But but I do I do want to play moves. I don't want to constantly tell you like what the move I can imagine at that level would be and then not play it, right? Like I I need I need to strike this balance. So I'm going to play e5. I could have moved my queen to b6. Previously I would have gone there, but I can't right now because of this knight. These knights are having a staring contest. Okay, I could take this with the bishop, I would not take it with the pawn because I would open my king, although it's not the end of the world. Uh, this safeguards the center, so it's definitely not a bad move. And my next move is going to be knight c5, unless my opponent plays bishop e3, uh, in which case I can't play knight c5, and I would, 
I, I, okay, well, now I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really considering knight c5. And, and, and if I take and, and split the pawns, that's going to be a problem for my opponent. I do have to keep this protected. Like a move like queen e3, for example, does attack my pawn. And so what I would probably do is take the bishop and go here. But it, it, it's, it's a very back and forth game. Uh, and uh, it is, I mean, it is, it, it, it is not clear at all who has an advantage here. You know, queen e2, okay, similar concept going after this. Queen e3 was a little bit more active. Um, I'm going to take because that was always my plan, but it's actually not like a fantastic situation for me because even though I'm weakening my opponent's d3 pawn, rook c1 is putting a lot of pressure on my pawn as well. So this one's going to go to the end game. This one's going to go to the end game. I'm going to have to take advantage of my opponent's damage structure and I will have to, I will just have to start playing a little bit faster. There's no... If, uh, if ands are, I, I can't speak. Uh, this move actually looks annoying, I have to say. Uh, trying to put some pressure here on, on the pin. And uh, I, I might have really underestimated that move, actually. So now I can't take, I can't really move. If I get taken, I'm going to have to make a trade, probably. Uh, bishop takes... And then, yeah, like, I, I, I might just have to make a waiting move here. I'm not really sure what. I mean, maybe I can... Let me just... Yeah, I'm going to make a waiting move. So if my opponent takes, I'm going to trade rooks, and one of the pieces is going to have to stop defending that pawn. I, I couldn't take with the rook, and I couldn't take with the pawn. And I couldn't move my queen out of the way, because then there would be this move. So, yeah, pretty crazy. <laughs> my opponent... Uh, Doing a, a nice job there. I mean, seriously, putting some very meaningful pressure on my position. Like I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a little bit, a little bit concerned. Not, not a huge amount concerned, but enough concerned. Okay, bishop takes. Um, I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I gotta take. I, I don't really see right. So now they're gonna take with a pawn, and I have. Mul you know what's what's funny? I don't know why they're thinking. What are they thinking about? They gotta take with a pawn. What's, what's the thought here? Okay. I can take like this, by the way. Which, um... It's probably bad. I don't know why I would do that. But I can take both ways. So let's trade, remove one of the defenders of the center pawn, and we're gonna get our rook in the center, and... It's, it's equal. I mean, what, 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 what to say, you know? Uh, opponent has played very, very well to this point, and, um... It's going to come down to a, a potentially crazy queen endgame. And my one advantage is that white's pawns are sort of stuck, and I can, like, get in there with a queen and try to win them. But you don't have to take. I mean, you don't have to take and, and activate my pieces for me. I'm expecting a move like queen d7, but queen d7 is very desperate. Like, a better move is queen d2, just, just waiting. Just not getting too hesitant. And then I'm going to start kind of marching in. When you're this deep in the endgame, uh... They just blundered a pawn. That's very bad. Yeah, queen d2 would have been a bit better. I guess my opponent did play quite well, but then panicked a little bit, and, and, and now is just losing because my king is very safe. Yeah, I expected queen d7, but the problem is I'm taking this, and the truth is I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm totally winning, actually, and, and I'm totally winning because I can give a check, and I just advance. And uh, I'm always looking for a queen trade. I'm always looking for a queen trade, but now my pawn's too strong. So once my pawn gets to guaranteed queening, it's over. What you can do here with white is you can try to go for perpetual check. You can try to catch me in a vortex. That's, that's the best option. Play like queen c4 and, you know, I, I, I do have to be careful not to get perpetualed. I would probably get out of that by kind of like hiding my king. Okay. Uh, yeah, but now I have queen c2, I'm looking for checks, queen c2, and, 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 and I've completely secured my pawn's promotion now. And there is no check. And not only that, you can't even, I mean, I guess you can play queen g5, you can play queen g5. That's maybe what you can do to try to hope for perpetual. Very good, and, and now I'm looking for, do I have a check and can I push? I need to just make sure that's protected. I can give a check myself, but then the king hides. So my, my, my logic here was going to be just to play f6, which, which I mean, it, it must work, right? Like, I, I, 
I, I'm just blocking the, the checks. Like I just, you know, and, and, and now I can even run my king. You know, that's, that's the funny part is like, I can dance all the way over to the other side of the board, just making sure I don't get mated. But like, if my opponent plays queen d4 and try, oh, but queen d8, I just go right back, right? So as long as you don't get caught in the vortex, you're going to survive. And because I have this very nice wall of pawns, uh, my king is just going to be able to dance around it constantly, and I can't get trapped in a circle. So Scandinavian is a, listen, Scandinavian's a tough opening uh, to crack with white. I mean, you saw my opponent there. They got a little bit of pressure, but, uh, okay, let me just double check that I'm not doing anything stupid. B2, check, king here, or, yeah, I mean, it looks like, it looks like that's it. I mean, that's one, if I get that second queen, it's game over. And, um, white put a little bit of pressure, but, yeah, that's not gonna cut it, unfortunately. And now we can even pre-move. We'll pre-move all these moves, because I am... Pretty certain there is no way through? I don't, yeah, I don't think so. I'm pre-moving all the moves. There's no way to trick me, because you might, yeah, you might check me, but that's not, yeah. I want to check, actually. I mean, listen, my opponent played very well that game. I, I'm going to have to raise my level today if, uh, if, if I want to have smoother games. So that's a check. And now you, you look for mate. You look for mate, and I think we're going to get a mate. We're going to get a mate right there. It's mate. Queen takes pawn. Of course, you can just do ladder. By far, the easiest thing to do with two queens is to just do a ladder mate. I don't know why my opponent is thinking right now. There we go. That's how we'll get that ladder. White had a pretty comfortable position. I mean, I got it. And by the way, by the way, e5 was a bad move. So queen b6 was equal. His position was in the balance. I allowed my opponent to get a little bit of activity. Um... And, uh, you know, d4, position's equal. I mean, the position is was in the balance for a while. White played very, very well, you know? And, and the Scandinavian's one of these openings, like, it forces the issue, but if white doesn't want to have fun, if white just wants to play an equal, solid game, it's going to be typical point two advantage that white gets. I think I followed my game plan pretty well, like, a, you know, this queenside advancement, and I was, uh, I, I thought my game plan was was pretty straightforward. Uh, the best move here is is probably not b4, uh, but it's okay. Like, I was going to play rook b8 or, or b4. And, I mean, you got to give credit to my opponent. Like, I think, I think white played quite well in this game and, uh, and tried, tried their best. I mean, really, like, that was, that, that was a very good game of chess. And it was balanced for a minute, and then it kind of went to the end game, and, and maybe my opponent needs the end game's master class. Because here, black is a bit better forever due to these weak pawns, and I would have very slowly, methodically brought my pieces down... Uh, in a position like this, you're always looking to simplify as well. You're looking like, will the transition to the pawn endgame be good or bad? That's endgame's masterclass. Use the code SPRING if you're interested. But um, I thought that was a, a very good start. A very, very good start. And uh, yeah, I mean, if that's indicative of, of anything that's going to happen today, I am, I am, I am slightly terrified. So um, 1500 is the next opponent. I don't know how to say this person's username. I'm playing white. <laughs> I was sitting here like waiting for my opponent to move. Um, let's play, uh, let's play D4. I don't, I, maybe I'll go for London, maybe I'll go for Queen's Gambit, we'll see. Maybe I'll go for Trumpowski. Maybe I'll go for Trumpowski. I think I'm gonna play E4 in my next game. I'm gonna play E4 against the uh, 1900. Today's a very tough episode. I don't, what's my, is my opponent doesn't know that it's their move? Okay, D4, C6. Fascinating, so do they want me to play? This, this is what people play if they want to go into a Karo Khan. Um, I can play a London, or we can play a Slav defense, like this. Uh, I feel like I play London all the time, but I also feel like, you know, London is one of these openings that's sort of always useful to, uh, to learn, so I'm, I'm gonna do it. I wonder if, if this was kind of the backup idea. A lot of people play like this as well. They, they try to immediately go after your B2 pawn. Okay, they're not doing that, so we're just going to play a London, and, and I'm going to show you why c6 is a very slight inaccuracy against the London when handled correctly. Everything in the London um, is based around these two squares, right? Uh, sorry, these two squares. Okay, they're trying to reverse London me. Oof, annoying. Let's develop our knight. That's basically never a bad move. And now we have to make an executive decision 
are we gonna turn this into a uh, queen's gambit, or are we gonna we gonna trade that bishop and not turn this into a queen's gambit? Um, c4 is a move now. Um, let's do it. I I always enjoy against opponents that move their light squared bishop out to put my queen out on b3. This is this this is simple. That's. This sort of plays into what we want, and, and this is not what my opponent, th this is really not what they should be going for, because they have so many pawns on light squares, you don't want to put pawns on light squares and then trade this bishop off. Now, there is a trap here. The trap is if I defend this knight with my rook, there is still a pin, and after rook c1, there is actually queen a2, which is probably why my opponent is going for this in the first place. Um, but that's why I would start with queen b3, which is... The entire reason we try to play c4 anyway, right? So now you have a choice. You know, you can trade the queens or not. Uh, I don't know which one is better. I, I, I would never trade the queens personally because I really like the pressure that I can exert on the position. So I think we'll do it that way. Now, black will probably play like this and try to put more pressure on this pawn, but now we can move the rook. Okay, so the plan here is probably just develop and castle. Like, we, we don't need to get into a big fight. I would feel much more comfortable getting into a big fight after castling. But also a move like bishop d6 is very, very annoying and is sort of the punishment for trading off your dark squared bishop. And I really want to play this move to kind of, you know what, I think I will. Like I, 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 like I said, I think I can't always be nice, right? It might not be the best move, but it's sort of the point. This is the point. The point is that if you give me the dark squares, and another way of, of doing this is if the bishop is back here on c1, what you do is you play a4 sometimes and then bishop a3. And if black plays a triangle defense in the queen's pawn in d4, c4 positions, you can't trade the dark squared bishop like this. And if you do, you have to do it in a way where you trade it for the dark squared bishop. Because if you trade oh, the dark squared bishop, all right, um, this is what's going to happen. And th this is straight out of Middle Games Masterclass on, on Chesley. You know, in case you want to check it out. Like, this move prevents castling. And what's going to happen now is, I mean, by the way, by the way, I think Bishop before is winning. I was going to go here. But this looks devastating. Where does the queen go? Because now I have a discovered attack. And I'm taking and they're going to lose pawns in the center, which is really bad. Yeah, my opponent's just on the run now. The question is, do I take this pawn or do I take this pawn? It's a very tough question. Or do I shove the pawn in? I don't know. I feel like pushing the pawn in, I, it might get a little stuck. So I think I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take this pawn to prevent the knight getting out. I don't want to help my opponent. I understand the bishop is going to come out, but I don't think that's a big deal. Like, I think you can just go back with my queen and... It's tough to say which one is better. I, I don't want to interfere on the dark square, so I think that's what I'm going to do. Now, black is going to go here unquestionably. Okay, or knight e7. They're trying to castle. Um, at this point, I, I don't think I can continue to bully here. So maybe it's time we do this, and now they're going to castle. Now I'm just a pawn up with the bishop pair. So what you do when you are up a pawn and the middle of the board has not really been determined, like who is winning the center of the board, take space. So I'm thinking e4, c4, knight g5 to make that advantageous exchange. Knight g5, there is this move. But that also does look quite promising. A nice little attack on the king with knight g5 and, and e4. I um, feel like a lot of people would play knight g5. Then bishop f5, then we can trade, take, take. The threat of mate is renewed. Yeah, let's go for this. So it's a threat to damage the structure and mate my opponent. Now... Very fortunate that bishop f5 is possible. I think... Oh, but that opened up this, right? And so I, I can take both. Um, let's simplify first. And now we're going to take on f8. Yeah, so that's, that's just a blunder. Unfortunately, I think my opponent's in a little bit of a panic mode here. Still instructive, though. How do we win this position? Okay, so now, again, we're up three points. We're, we're up a lot. So how do we win this? There's a lot of possibilities. Advancing with your pawns to make trades is good. Uh, flank pawn to open up the rooks is good. Bishop here to trade the bishop for the knight is good. A lot is good. I think the best move, I see a rook and I see a king, and I'm like, let's just open it up. 
I mean, really. And if the opponent plays knight e7, that opens my queen. And that's bad to worse, right? Like, f5 is a devastating move for black right now because I'm going to shred the position open. My queen is getting in. My rook is getting activated. And you've got to be sharp with how to activate your pieces without actually moving them. And I think this is just really brute force. Just f4, f5. Um, I mean, I can shove the king into the corner, but I, this, this just looks so powerful, right? Queen and rook getting in. Very powerful stuff. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a bishop attack on the way. Um, we got a queen attack on the way, shoving the king back. We're, Black's very lucky queen f8 is not a checkmate. And by the way, by the way, if you just want to snap the knight off just to make it easier, you can probably do that. Um, queen f7 to trade queens is, is a good move. Uh, but I'm going to go for it. I'm, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set a trap. I'm going to play rook f3 to double my... Okay, my opponent's just playing too fast. <laughs> um... The trap was this, but then there would be queen f8 checkmate. Now what's funny is I can still play rook f1, and I'm still going for a queen sacrifice checkmate on the back rank. But in a real rapid game, you would need to play a bit faster, because three minutes down is, uh, is really not a good situation. I'm sacrificing my bishop to sacrifice my queen. Okay. And uh, now I also have a very fancy tactic, by the way. Um, it doesn't quite work. So I... I, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up for it's actually taking the knight. It's a very famous tactic. I couldn't do it on this move because they would have taken my bishop, unfortunately. It's still winning, of course, but um the tactic is taking the knight and black's king is stuck because of my bishop, so rook h3 is actually mate. Kind of brutal. In fact, I am threatening this tactic even if the queen goes there, because they are they have to stop mate. Yeah, so I can take the knight. This is really brutal. Look at this. Ow. Very, very nasty. And they can't take because... Okay, well, they do, and... Yeah, unfortunately. That is... Uh, I, think, I think this person was just a bit nervous. They, they played a bit nervy. They played a bit fast. And uh, we do get the win. Shout out to the D4 Dynamite course. Again, you like anything you see? You can check out the courses and use the code SPRING. Um, I think that was a pretty smooth game. And I, and I think I demonstrated the problem of my opponent giving up the dark squared bishop too early. So in the London, against these kind of slow positions like with c6, first of all, don't play e4 because your opponent obviously wants to play a Karo Khan, right? So I like to turn the game into a queen's gambit in many, many different London positions because I like to bring my queen out and put pressure on this pawn, particularly when this bishop leaves. It's just kind of my strategy. And this is incorrect. You see how the advantage goes from 0.2, which is standard in the opening, to 0.6. If I played knight bd2, knight c3 is 0.4. Um, and now it's 0.6, and, and now it's, it's 1. It's plus 1 on move 7. So even at 1500 rapid, if you don't have the exact knowledge, the exact understanding of some of these openings, you're going to run into these problems where it, it just won't work. Like, you're, you're, the way you're playing this opening just doesn't work. And now it's 2.5! Now it's 2.5. And, 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 you know, it's 2.5 because of bishop d6. Now, I got, it, I got an inaccuracy here because I was just trying to castle. But again, the best move to prevent your opponent from castling. You're going to have these positions sometimes. The stronger you are at chess, 1500, 16, 17, depending on how the opening goes... You're going to have these moments where you're like, I know my opponent wants to castle, but can I not let them? And bishop d6 is how you don't let them castle. Because if they castle, they're going to lose the knight. There's no easy way to defend the knight. You see what happened, and all of a sudden, black is completely lost. Black is down a pawn and still has all the problems of the position. And we got there because our opponent played in a way where, where, where the, the opening didn't make sense. It wasn't a cohesive approach to the opening. So, first of all, y'all need something against the London. Unfortunately, that's the reality of the situation. Um, and uh, it, that, that's, that's sort of how it works in, in, in modern day. And I thought I, I did a nice job demonstrating that uh, in this game in particular with this kind of queen b3 approach. And then once we got the extra pawn, you know, knight g5 is the best move. And my idea here was that after this... I can, sure, I can advance and, you know, I can, I can, I can play f4, I can just get as aggressive as possible. My simple plan was just to trade. Mate is still threatened, so black has to weaken their king. And then we, 
have a lot of dark squared weaknesses to work with. Maybe I would play e4 and try to get my queen over there, right? That, that looks very nice. If the opponent starts kicking me out, they have weak pawns near the king, but, if, but a lot of chess has to be played, and there is no guarantee at all that we would have won. But, but uh, we did. Now, I think my next opponent is actually challenging me, but I don't see it. Uh, the next person I actually have to issue a challenge to. Uh, there we go. Or I just auto started the game. So, yes, my opponent didn't develop correctly there. And, um, I think my, th this opponent is on a mobile device. So, I will remind them that I started the game. I started the game. Okay. Sometimes there's, uh, drama in how to win at chess. Okay, now my opponent is not online. That's, <laughs> that's always a bad sign. Will they go back? There we go. Let's try again. This person is 1720. Okay, this time we have a d4. I've played the Dutch uh, quite a bit. I've played it quite extensively, so I'm going to go back to playing the Dutch defense. Uh, again, all this stuff is available. Oh, my opponent's playing my course against me. That's so funny. Oh my goodness, this is very funny. I think my opponent owns the d4 dynamite course. Queen d3 is, is, is kind of my, my idea. Uh, okay, I didn't invent it or anything, but the point is to put pressure on this pawn and, uh, and, and potentially get black into a very, very dangerous position by sacrificing over here. So if my opponent is well prepared, uh, they are going to get themselves into a very good position. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take the center. And now the idea, yeah, that's, that's the point. And that's, that, that, that could be very, very scary. Uh, to deal with if you've never seen before. So my my suggestion would be don't take. <laughs> my suggestion would be uh, play a bit more solidly. All right, I'm gonna play e6. I'm gonna I'm gonna react as a, as a person that that is getting hit with a gambit, right, and doesn't kind of want to get bulldozed. So we have a trade, and now I'm just gonna develop, right? I'm gonna I, I'm gonna develop my pieces. I'm gonna get my knight out, get my bishop out, and when you're getting hit with a gambit early in the game, you want to keep calm. All right, you don't want to panic. Like I'm, I'm seeing this. So the first thing that comes to mind is just play pawn to g6. Now there are times you can strike back, right? And so this is kind of funny. This is like one of those moments where the the sensei is having you know their tricks used against them. I am basically giving my opponent the optimal setup. Now my opponent's playing very fast. Again, don't know if this is like nerves or if this is just how people play. Like they're just really really fast. Uh, I can play bishop g7. Or I can offer a trade of bishops. I do like relieving the pressure here. Okay, my opponent's just, just rattling off moves. I mean, so quickly. It's like unbelievable. Um, I don't want to trade. It's a very, very normal idea by white to try to get me to trade to open up the rook. So let me develop my knight. Normally, knight is bad in front of the c pawn. It's not good to put the knight in front of the c pawn. But I think I want a castle queen. That was really bad. Um, they had the option to do that on the last move. And because of that, I mean, it's basically like white lost the whole turn. I mean, think about this. If my opponent took, it would be white's move with my queen out. But look at now, it's white's move and I have my queen and knight out. So that was bad. Um, that was a big waste of time, actually. I just got a whole move. And I hope that's instructive because, yeah, that was definitely inaccurate. And I can get my bishop out here. I'm going to put the bishop here because I want to keep the e-file open. It's a little bit instructive. We're getting to that level now where every move counts. Every decision counts. I'm going to castle long. I think white is also going to castle long. And now, now I'm, I'm going straight in, right? I mean, I, I'm defending that square very nicely. And I'm going to put rooks on the open file. And my opponent did play the gambit, but they didn't play it exactly right. And if you don't play this opening exactly right, you're, you're going to fail to put people under pressure. I mean, when you play really aggressively in the beginning of the game, if you rush it and you... It, a lot of my opponents, they're playing very fast. They, they kind of got to chill out. They got to think about their moves. If you, if you don't put your opponents under meaningful pressure, uh, they're just going to get out of it and, and um, I, they're going to have a better position. I'm really worried white is going to go here. Like... You really don't want to play a move that's so passive, but luckily they, they do, and they, 
do in fact play that move. That was the best move. Queen e3 would have run it headfirst into pawn to f4. Now, let's get a couple of things out of the way. Um, what does my opponent want, right? Tough to say. Because when you look at forward moves in this position, there's really not a lot. Like, why can't make a whole bunch of moves? You can't go here because that's a fork. Um, so for me, you know, I don't want to touch this. This is rock solid. I'm thinking just put that rook on the open file. I'm also thinking get my king out of just all of that. That's, that's, that's always a useful move. Um, I don't want to take. I don't want to relieve the pressure. I want to go on an attack, but then I would relieve my control of the center. So... And then it's a question of which rook do I put? Well, if I put this rook here, you know, on that square, what, what happens to this rook? Like, I'm thinking there, and then this rook is free to roam. That's what I'm going to do. I'm definitely better. Like, I'm much better. Um, I'm much better because I have very good control of the position right now. Clearly, white is trying to play f3, right? Now that the knight left the center, it's important in chess to have this concept in your head called continuity. That knight used to control e5. It no longer does, which means I can go for my own journey, right? I didn't want to go out here and try to come back and try to attack the queen side because this knight could plop into the e5 square. Huh. So do I take with the pawn? Do I take with the rook? Do I take with this pawn to open up the bishops, which will, you know, trade? Oh, they all look good. But, you know, I, I, I think rook takes or d takes is what I think. I think rook takes because you keep applying pressure and you don't open the position. D takes because connect four is nice, but also you don't trade pieces. The side that wants to attack wants to keep more pieces on the board, right? I'm not asking. I'm, I'm, I'm telling, right? Like... I mean, rook e4 looks nice, but then the knight could re-enter the battle, and do we care about the fact that the knight can re-enter the battle? Like, are we worried that the rook can get kicked out of the center of the board? I'm going to take like this. I think, I think this move, rejoining my pawns together, creating this wall, not allowing the bishop in, not allowing the knight out, that looks right to me. I think rook takes probably is the best move. Like, at my level, I would be playing rook takes. At 1800 level, I, I, I would be okay with this. And some of you may be wondering, like, isn't that bishop really scary? No. I would not evaluate things like that. I would not evaluate things like, the bishop is very scary. No, you know who's scary? My queen and my bishop. Like, who's going to defend the white position from my pieces, right? Who's going to defend the white position? This bishop is, is not participating in the game. Neither is the white knight. I'm the one that's about to call the shots. May maybe I should bring my rook up and over. If b3, I might have queen a3 in the future. I don't want to trade queens, by the way. Never, ever, ever trading queens in this position. Queen a6, right? That's queen d5. Then b3. Then maybe I, you know, maybe I don't have anything there. Maybe knight c4 first. Maybe queen a6 first. I don't know what's the best move. I'm going to go here, right? Because I'm, I'm already looking at all sorts of different ideas on, on, on that square. Now, white will probably play b3, and then do I have a sacrifice? I don't, I don't think so, unfortunately. I don't think I have a sacrifice. I probably need a little bit of help from one of my other pieces. If my opponent defends this the right way, they, they probably should be all right. You know, I probably should have went knight c4 first. Oh, they are not respecting my, my position here, though. I mean, f3 is a logical move, but even if I take, and then that just opens up the e-file for me. You know, knight c4, pawn takes. I don't have a queen sacrifice, but I do have a fork. And then I have queen a2, and that's just winning. I mean, that's just, yeah, knight c4. This is a, a, I'm dominating. I should have went knight c4 first because it prevented b3 because I would have had a fork. Very instructive. Instead of here, which allowed the spike to come out, I should have went knight c4 first. It's about preventing moves. So right now, we are setting up a threat that will win the game. We're setting up knight e3, which attacks the queen and attacks this. They can't play b3 because I forked the king and the queen. But something has to, like, somebody has to prevent this move. So queen c1. Then maybe I just play e3 and plop the knight in. Right oh, that's, yeah, it's brutal. It's a really brutal attack now. So that's a fork, by the way. I mean, this is, that's a fork. 
I can be patient for a move. I'm playing like queen b5, just, just being a menace. Um, but sometimes it's better to just, yeah, let's just keep it simple. I mean, it's a fork, right? Like, we know we're winning a, a, a rook guaranteed, so let's just do it, right? Like, we, we're getting rewarded for our attack. So we're getting in, we're going to pick up the rook, and then, again, I would not allow white to take us because it's going to break apart our structure. If anything, I'm taking or I'm keeping the tension by defending this pawn. So I want to take back here when white takes, but not to open my position, instead maybe with my bishop. So I'm looking at bishop d5, I'm looking at bishop c4. Um, king would be nice on b8. Like if I could just adjust my king to the b8 square, I think I would be very happy. Um, that, would be, uh, that would be great, but no, I, yeah, this is very tough for white because um, not only are you going to lose material, like the attack doesn't stop. Like, my queen is still going to go in on the light squares <laughs> if I really want. I, I, so you, you, you sacrifice the material to get my knight off the board to kind of relieve the attack temporarily, but the attack's not going anywhere. And um, I'm going to play I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm going to keep it very simple. Now the option is go in for the checkmate, which probably doesn't work right away. Um, or just build the pressure here. Uh, of course I can take, right? Like I, I've talked about it, but it's, it's this question of do I want to help activate my opponent's pieces? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Not really. Like I don't really want to help activate my opponent's knight. You know what I mean? I don't want my opponent's knight in the game. So, but I do have to play faster. I'm not playing fast enough and that's not, that's not, I'm not being a good role model. So let's go for checkmate. If takes, my backup plan is just to take. And then we trade bishops. And as I've said a million times, one of the ways to win a winning position is just to trade the pieces. Like, trade the bishops, go to an endgame, but save yourself enough time that you're not going to blunder. Okay, it's a logical decision. Um, I guess we can trade the queens. I mean, this has got to be the best move because you're threatening a bunch of stuff. But now I have queen d1, and this was probably overlooked. And this is sort of the problem when you have such passive pieces. Oh, I have a beautiful tactic. No, I don't. Bishop a2 check, deflecting the king. But there's king up, and then if check, there's king to the corner. So we're just going to dance around, but nothing's actually going to happen. Uh, queen e2 does threaten mate, by the way. <laughs> That's a very sneaky checkmate threat. My opponent might go, oh, nothing's hanging, I can take and blunder that. That would be really sweet if they took and blundered queen a2 mate. Uh, if they move the knight, I'm going to take the pawn or that pawn, and yeah, white's position is just disintegrating. Just disintegrating, so. Um, I called it. Yeah, I called it. I called it. I called it. I called it. Let's, uh, let's take a quick look at the game. That was, that was very aggressive. That was my opponent playing uh, the d4 dynamite against me. It's kind of tough when you play it against me, you know? Um, that's uh, that's going to be difficult. This is a very aggressive gambit early. And again, in general, if, you're, if your opponent is gambiting all sorts of pawns against you in the beginning of the game, I would say don't open yourself up. Like, it's not the best move sometimes, according to the computer, to play solid. But trust me, your king is going to really appreciate it in the long run. Um, this was the Dutch. Gotham Dutch, of course, is clashing. Uh... You already, I already told the code to you. I'm not going to tell you again. And I just developed and offered an exchange. And this was an instructive moment. This reconsideration lost white all hope in this game. It was equal. Retreating was slightly worse for white. But wasting a whole move on that. Look what happened by the time we castled. It's minus 1.3. And it's minus 1.3 because the bishop is stuck. The knight is stuck. And that knight is stuck. And I get it. Look, whenever I do this uh, series... You know, if my opponent was playing another 1700 and wasn't playing me, nerves would be different, quality of moves would be different. But I'm just trying to kind of get y'all to understand, like, if you play aggressively in the beginning of the game, you can't just start trading the pieces and wasting time. This concept of backing up and then changing your mind, you could do that in real life, but you just gave me a whole move, right? Now it's White's move, and like I said, if my opponent had just done that, it would have been White's move like this, so White lost an entire tempo. 
And that's what gave them the bad position. And then I thought I played in an instructive way, planting my knight in the center, putting my rook in the center line. And now, yeah, the best move here for black is to understand that rushing out this way while the knight can take the center is bad. But the second that my opponent backed up, I was coming in like this. And now let's just check something. So this is the best move. I played the best move in the game, which is minus one, keeping my pawns together, restricting the enemy knight. Uh, rook takes c4 is the second best move. But the reason why this is not the best move is it still allows white activity. It allows white's pieces to have targets. Whereas the way I played it in the game, I created this situation where the knight is just stuck. The bishop is stuck. And uh, then we just, yeah, queen a6 was a mistake. It was much better to play knight c4 to prevent b3. Instructive. I played it. I played too fast. And that was definitely the wrong decision ultimately. So uh, queen a6 was minus, one point, uh, minus 0.8, but this was actually a much stronger move. But uh, this is a totally winning position. And we, we just swarmed in. We, we played the simple move, which is just to pick up the rook. It's not even the best move, by the way. The best move in this position is bishop d5. <laughs> just dominance. I mean, it's just, it's just not letting white move. So uh, instructive. But that's, uh, that's how it goes. And that was, you know, that was my opponent playing a very, very aggressive line against me. Nice game to my opponent. Listen, I appreciate anybody that comes in to try to take my head off. I'm um, playing somebody from the UK this game. Going to play E4. And we are going to see. We're going to see what they play. E4, E5. Okay. Um, proud owners of my E4 course, the oldest course that I have, know that I'm a big fan of the Vienna. But of course, we can, we can play anything under the sun. Let us, in fact, go for a Vienna. Uh, we're going to see which, which Vienna my opponent goes for. Do they allow the gambit? Do they play knight c6? Uh, they do allow the gambit, okay? So I will play the gambit. You don't have to play the gambit. I mean, you can play the gambit sometimes. You can play something else other times. So we're, we're going into a, uh, into a Vienna gambit. Now, here's the, here's the drawback of the Vienna gambit as you go up the rating ladder. It's very forcing. So if you're playing a 2000 um, and they know what they're doing, they have prepared, right? They know what they're doing. Uh, and this is, this is all part of the course. Um, they're going to get an okay position. It's just going to be equal, right? So if my opponent plays knight c6 or f5, they are very well prepared. Those are the best moves. Uh, knight takes c3 is what people play when they get into this position. Okay, knight c6 is normal. Now we play bishop to b5. And the best line here for black is to trade this knight, give a check, and unfortunately my opponent is doing just that. Um, so I can play this pawn taking on c3 here. This is... Uh, this is what we do. Normally we take like this, but now in this particular variation, we want to open up our dark squared bishop. And uh, the best line is now to give a check and to trade. Like I said, if a person is well prepared and they go for this end game, you just got to play chess. If you're 2000, you just got to play chess. The way you get better at chess is you say, you know what? I don't always want to play the Vienna game, but I can play G3, which is another type of Vienna, right? I can play four knights. That's not the best move, but it is a move for sure. Uh, it's not the best move because, well, I know that queen h4 is the best move. So I'm going to take because I don't really know why else my bishop is out there. And now we're going to think, right? So knowing what we know about queen h4, I'm thinking that we can develop our knight quickly and castle. I'm also thinking maybe we put the bishop on f4 to then block that check with a pawn. The only reason I would not play this move is because it would weaken my b-file, but maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe that doesn't matter at all. Now, I also think black might want to go there, which is why I like bishop e3, but bishop e3 does not stop the idea of queen h4. So there's a lot on my mind. <laughs> there's a lot on my mind. And, and unfortunately, in a rapid game, you, you can't solve chess. I can't solve chess, period, but uh, especially in a rapid game. So uh, let's. I'm probably not going to make the best move. I mean, that's just, that's just the reality of life. So let's play knight e2, and let's try to castle. We're going to castle, use our open f file. This pawn could be an asset for us, could be a liability. Could be a liability. The reason why I say asset restricts black's pieces, right? Asset, it could be very well protected. So now if black does not play energetically in the Vienna, black will get a losing position. So if black plays bishop e7 and castle very slow, we're going to get a really good position. We're going to castle, queen here, target the king, Black has to play energetically against the Vienna. 
That's just the way that one of the major benefits of the Vienna is that if black plays simple, solid chess, it's actually gonna backfire. And you'll notice in today's video, frequently I'm like, oh, I'm just gonna play the solid move. You know, I'm just gonna castle. Can't do that against the Vienna. So they do play Queen H4. Now, this is the natural move. This was my other idea to stop Queen E4. And I kind of like it. Like, I don't see anything wrong with this. I mean, I, I do kind of want to get the queen out of my territory. But what's wrong with just knight g3? Like, to prevent queen e, queen e4. They might go queen g4. And then, like I said, you, you just got to play. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Here's queen g4. Um, we don't have to take. That's number one. Um, if we do take, we can kick the bishop out. It'll probably go to e6. We can avoid a queen trade completely. Question is, is that dumb? And I'm saying there because I want to prevent bishop c5. Very, like, it's a point that I'm not playing queen d3. Playing queen f2. I really do want to keep queens on the board. I mean, it's very much my style. Then maybe something like bishop here will happen. Castle, castle. And I can show you maybe how to do that attack. But queen f2 and this queen is so active. Like, do we, do we want that? Do we want to live with that burden? And also the queen could go there and stop us from casting. There's a, a lot of potential unpleasantries that can happen if we don't trade queens. Got to think about it. I'm not convinced that not trading the queens is the right move. It very well could be. But I kind of want to do it on my terms. Let's back up. Let's see if my opponent spots this move, preventing me from castling, just like I did to my second round opponent. This is a very natural move. This is not. Queen c4 is very mean, because it also... I can't go b3, because I lose this pawn. Okay. That's not a good move. Because queen's a bit offside now. And I have moves like h. You know, first I got a castle. Definitely. <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to risk that again. Now bishop b7 is probably going to be played with some, you know, nefarious ideas over there. Um queen c4 is still possible, but it, it definitely lost a little bit of its sting. I kind of want to kick the queen out. I also kind of want to play knight f5 and I also kind of want to just speed up. Uh queen e3 might trap the queen in some lines. No, cuz there's this. Let's kick out the queen. Queen h4 is annoying, but not dangerous. Just annoying. But not dangerous. My throat is scratchy. And queen g6 is also probably a good move. Somehow I miss queen g6. And now bishop h4 could be on the way. Yeah, we might, we might need to play a move like knight to f5 and just sort of play an endgame, which... It's unfortunate, but when you're 2,000, sometimes there's nothing better. Like, wait, you know, playing moves like bishop f4 is fine, but what's next is the major question. I can't tell you what's next. So I'm going to play knight f5. And um, I'm targeting the bishop. And um, it's going to be an endgame. It's going to be an endgame, and we're going to see who has, who has a better position. I think the best option for black is something like to trade once and leave my queen alone. I don't think trading a second time is great, but it could be. And I, I really desperately want my bishop on this square to at least defend my center pawn, but it's just equal. I mean, it's just... And this is sort of like... If you can't blow a, a, an opponent off the board in the Vienna, you, you got to... And it's just chess. I mean, chess is a 2,000-rated player I'm playing. I can't just win in 10 moves. Okay, they trade with the queen, which is mildly more forcing, but nothing really changes. Uh, King d7 doesn't quite work. Okay, f6 is a normal move. Uh, but I'm really curious if I can go e6. I can't because i feel like my pawn will perish but you know what i am kind of relieved i have to tell you uh i'm a little bit relieved that i no longer have to deal with that weakness 
Maybe we play bishop d2 and b3. I also like bishop f4. I like bishop d2 and b3. I mean, it strikes me as very, very, very natural. I could also trade the bishop, maybe? Who has a better bishop? What a question. Who has a better bishop? Oh. Maybe we just, we, we try to play a rook end game. Let's do it. Let's try to play a rook end game. This is an interesting move. Black might castle. Defending the pawn. Very interesting. And then it's going to come down to who has the better structure. And I would argue it's white, but it's probably about equal. So if bishop takes, I will take with the rook. Black can castle. It's probably the best, yeah. It's probably the best. Castling now. G6 I don't think is great. Because I feel like the king is going to get stuck in the center somehow. I'm going to like maybe zigzag. Oh, this is a nasty looking move. To just damage the structure. That looks really nasty. It's a very instructive move, potentially. And my opponent is going to have tripled isolated pawns. Now, the one thing they can do is play rook b8. They've got to create counterplay. And I'm going to try to eat all the pawns. So here, I'm going to go rook c5. I might not even go rook c5 because these pawns are not going anywhere. I might like give a check first, deflect the king, make it go one way. Maybe give this, maybe give a check on e5 and then a check on d1 and shove the king into c8. Maybe that's, but that doesn't look good to me. I mean, again, I'm looking at rook e5, forcing the king to the d file and then rook d1. King d6, rook e4, c5, c3. That looks pretty convincing to me. Like, rook d1 is fine, but there might be long castle. So, deflecting the king, forcing the king to make a decision to walk in to the other rook. When you have the advantage of, of, of striking first in an endgame, it's very, like, c5 cuts all the communication of the black position here. But rook d1 is also very strong. The king is going to come try to help. But I'm too quick to this pawn. That's the problem. I also have other ideas, like maybe, you know, when the pawn comes here, I can deflect off the B pawn. But the simplest way is just to go C3. And I'm winning that pawn. And black still has all the problems of the other things in this endgame. And listen, at this level, endgames are so important, which is why I made the endgames masterclass. But right now, winning that tempo on my rook and playing defense is imperative. Now, do I have... Something a little more emphatic there, like king d6, can I go back to the back rank and play c3 and rook e8, maybe, maybe take and take on d4? I don't know. I don't know. This is definitely the best move. And then the question is, where do I move? I kind of want to go there. Oh, that, that very well could be the best move. Just to, yeah, just to have this threat. I gotta play a little faster, so I'm gonna do it. That looks menacing. Just not allowing black to move that rook. And now I go here, and I'm... I think what my opponent has to do is get this rook into the game. But it's too slow. It's too slow. I'm taking everything. I'm too fast. Rook b8 might still be the best move, but then I take with check. Oh, but maybe I don't because king e5. So maybe I... Play B3. I just wait. I just keep my structure intact. That you don't want to play. You don't want to make moves that are so passive. Because I can be patient. You see, my position is so strong. I can just wait. I don't have to scrap. My rook getting trapped. It's not. I can take. I'm going to take. King B6, I just take the pawn. That would be a big blunder. Now they're going to capture. And now I'm a pawn up. Now I'm a pawn up with all the benefits of the position. Black's only option is to get in with the rook. I gotta be precise. I gotta be precise. I still gotta attack. I gotta hunt. A rook trade now is good for me. Just one, though, preferably. If you're trying to win a rook endgame, I mean, in this case, I could trade all the rooks, but... And now... Okay, they're cutting off my king. I could play b4. This still looks very controlled. I look very controlled here. Looking at a4, looking at b5, looking at rook c5, by the way. Rook c5, again, forcing the king to the corner. Been doing that all game. I wouldn't go here because there's no infiltration. 
Black's game plan there was to cut my king off. But that's not the game plan. The game plan should be get in. It shouldn't be cut my king off. I don't want my king. I'm very powerful without my king. Black's game plan should be create counterplay. And the longer you wait, the worse it's going to get because I'm going to go rook c5. Right? Okay, I guess they're trying to double, but it's, it's too slow. It's too slow. The strategy is too slow because I'm, I'm going to get rook c5. I'm going to get b5. I'm going to slowly make progress. Like, my king is, is always safe on h2 from rooks. It's, it's never in danger. Right? Okay, that, that move makes, definitely makes sense. Now, do it. Can I? It all looks so good. C5, B5, just, just shove it all backwards. I mean, this looks, that might have been bad, actually. That might have been silly. Yeah, because of that move. And now I might need to, I can't really go B5 because king here. That's the problem. That might, that's the problem. But I got I to gotta pretend it was all part of the plan. So let's play rook C4. I mean, this is all still frozen over here. It's all still frozen, and I'm trying to go b5. I also have rook a6. Like, I could have tried to... This was wrong, because I totally blanked that the king could just go right back to where it was. I'm still better, but I really should be a little bit more precise than that. But... Uh, can I run to the back rank? Yeah, rook c1, and we're still hammering away. Like, if you get a little arrogant here, I'm going to punish you very quickly. And... Okay, b5 I can, I can still play, right? b5, pawn takes, pawn takes. sp5 looks very good, actually. Yeah, and, and once I use my majority of pawns here, don't pre-move, because they could go here. <laughs> if you pre-move here and they take, you're going to lose your rook. You're going to throw your computer out a window. Um, this was... Once you get a pawn majority of three on two like this, what's going to happen is you're going to get them to become full passers. So if black doesn't take, if black goes rook a7, I'm going b6. And, and, and that, oh, am I going b6? <laughs> my rook might get trapped. Oh my goodness, that is actually insane. My rook might get trapped. Wow, I've never seen anything like that. If I play b6, my rook could get locked away. That is crazy. I have never seen something like that. If rook goes here... Well, the way they're doing it, I, I mean, I can probably take on a6 and play rook b1, rook b6, something like that. But, yeah, wow. That is actually, I've never seen something like that. My rook, I can trade the rook, of course, but then my opponent will be pretty quick with their counterplay too. I might just need to start bringing my king. It might be unstoppable force meets immovable object here. That is crazy. Wow. King g3, maybe? Just bring my king. I'm going to play h5. I mean, I can play h4. I mean, this is great. I've never seen something like this. Rook endgames are so wild. On take c6. King c6. And then I just try to dance in with my rook somehow. This might be the way. And I try to dance in with my rook. Try to get rook b1, or rook e1 maybe, or rook d1. Fascinating. This is, th this is so wild. I've never seen an endgame like this one. Rook e1, rook f5, rook e6 check. Nuts. <laughs> All right, rook e1. I'm going for it. I just have to make sure my rook is safe. And then maybe rook f6 and I, and I go to b1. <laughs> just try to save my rook like that. h4 is possible, but I'm going up. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to take as many pawns as I can. I don't want to get my king locked away. This is a wild endgame. When you're down to this low in a rapid game, play fast. But it's instructive the way my opponent has defended this. Probably have a check, right? Check and I'm, am I winning this pawn? Could also win these pawns. Hello, I don't, I don't have to just... Speaking of which... Speaking of which... <laughs> those pawns look mighty tasty right now. And I'm still going back for this one. Now, king c4 is a very, very, very tricky move here. To try to trap my rook. 
but it doesn't work because my rooks will team up on the fifth rank. I've been I've been looking for ways to kick the door open for that rook that was there. Oh man, and I and my opponent did get a, a, a bit low on time here. Uh, you see, they played it. <laughs> but luckily, I have this. Not lucky. I mean, you know, it's part of the game. And now, I'm getting out, and uh, my rooks defend each other, and I'm I'm gonna win enough pawns that I'm I'm gonna feel comfortable now. Yeah, but now, yeah, now I just. This is winning, and this is easy. Two pawns up, and uh, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my opponent's king off. Yeah, now they're off on the last rank of the board. This is a totally winning endgame. H4, H5, and just don't blunder a rook. Don't blunder anything, preferably. That was actually very silly. Now, that's me. That was a very good game of chess by Black, and it is difficult to be a 2000. I mean, I'm telling you right now, 2000s are good chess players. Uh, and my opponent was well prepared in the Vienna. They got themselves to an equal position, and they played very well. I mean, Black was equal for the entirety of the opening. Um, I played like this, and we got, you know, this end game. Positions 0.1. 0.1 either way. Uh, I personally think here, trading my weakness was not a good decision. I think Black should have tried to get pressure on it, like Rook F8, and then King D7, and then King on E6. When you traded the weakness, and I was able to trade into this end game. White is going to be better here because structurally, black is struggling. Black has a um, black has a weak structure, but black played really, really well. And I mean, look at the two thousand level. You've got to find a move like this: sacrificing a, a pawn in an endgame to split the position. Tripled isolated pawns in any endgame, even if temporarily down a pawn, can never, ever be good. Ever. It just can't be good, right? And um, yeah, that, uh, that's, that's where the move C4 came in handy. And I thought this was instructive. Um, the best move in this position being rookie five check, which is funny because game review calls it an inaccuracy. And yet the analysis here that I'm looking at, sometimes that happens, game review calls it an inaccuracy. This is 0.77 and this is 0.81. So they're basically the same. Game review sometimes make you, makes you feel dumb. Um, I thought everything that I did here was smart, getting to this end game. I went forward with my pawns, and this was a bad move. Um, what I should have done is I should have hunted from the side. I should have went rook e4, trying to go rook e6. If rook f6, uh, then I should have saved the rook and played a5. It's instructive. I mean, it's instructive. I should have gotten both my rooks out to make them participate. This move gets a fat question mark. Because all of a sudden my rook is trapped, and I'm still I'm still better, but it's a headache actually rescuing my rook. And here I was really scared of things like uh, let's say the position locks up. How do I win? Like how do I rescue my rook? <laughs> what's What's crazy is that if I play something like rook d1 after king c4, I have look at this, look at this, my rook is trapped. I was straight up losing. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, I can save my rook by like creating tactics on this file, but. Um, yeah, I should have, um, I should have been better there. I definitely should have been better. Um, in this position, you know, my opponent could have defended a little bit more resiliently, but, but I'm always going to have pressure against a bad structure like this. Um, I'm going to try to play rookie one and hope my opponent takes, and then I'll play like rookie two and rook c5. And it, it, it's just going to be an annoying end game to defend. Is black going to be fine in the long run? Yeah, of course. And I mean, stockfish will hold this end game. A million times out of a million, but that's chess. Like, you, you play openings in chess, you play certain openings that get you to a more pleasant and comfortable position. And um, queen h4 check is uh, the best move, but there's nothing wrong with a6. And then here, I thought I played fine. Computer likes queen f2 right away, which is actually quite nice. Stopping bishop c5 and queen h4. It's a nice move, and knight f3. I'll add that to my toolbox for for the future. But it was a very good game. Very, very good game. And uh, we will end with an even tougher matchup of 2300. So, 
This person uh, it, uh, might, uh, has a chat GPT icon and um, is named I am pasta. Or, although I think, there, I think that's an L. Now, what do I play against E4? Um, I know a lot of openings. I mean, I could play the Carl Concourse. I could play a lot of different things. I haven't played E5 in a while. So, opponent plays Knight F3. What are they going to play? Which Okay, they play this. One of my sleeper best courses is called the Black Gambits. And in the Black Gambits course against the Spanish, I recommend F5, which is the Yanish or the Schliemann. And personally, I, I really love this opening. I, I think you get some really, really fun positions. It's actually a Vienna Gambit reversed. You may realize I just had a game where I gambited my F-pawn. Uh, and here, the, the line that to me is the easiest to play is just to take Knight F6 and develop the bishop. Um, I don't think there's... I mean, you can play Knight F6 and you can sort of wait. I like to just take, play Knight F6. Uh, my opponent is castling because they are trying to not allow me to, to hit this knight. I haven't played this in a while, so this could backfire, but um, hopefully not. I think the line is just bishop c5, although it could be d6. It could be to be a little bit more solid, but I think it's just bishop c5. And then d6. Taking this is a bit dangerous, I think. Um, meaning taking that and then taking this. So knight g5 is a thing, but I somehow am not afraid of it. Like knight g5, just queen e7. I don't... Okay, knight f7, I play rook f8. They could give me a check. Just play king d8. Like, this is scary. So I would not play the black gambits for the faint of heart. And I don't want to rush with h6, because that would weaken some of my other light squares. So... But if they don't play knight g5, I'm probably going to go bishop g4. I'll trade the knight, they won't have any of that. h3, okay. Yeah, that stops what I want. Annoying. Now queen e7 and bishop e6 still looks very natural. If I play h6, how bad is it on knight h4? I mean, I, I really don't want to allow it. Like, I don't know why I would allow that. So let me go queen e7. I'm expecting knight g5. If they don't play knight g5 and they instead play knight c3, uh, maybe I could have went for knight a5, by the way. I'm not sure. Knight a5 to try to get the bishop. That also would have been seemingly smart. I don't know how smart, but... So bishop e6, knight d5, I can take with the bishop. They could take with the bishop. I could also take with the pawn. And I would bring my knight back. Wrap around. This just strikes me as the best move. Just getting rid of this really powerful bishop. They could take, drop a knight in, then I'm going to castle along. They could take, attack my queen... Yeah, they just do that. Now, queen f7 is losing to knight g5. Don't, don't, don't hang that. Knight takes is losing. Um, queen d7 is an interesting move, but I don't know why I would do that. Like, I think my plan was just pretty straightforward, just to take with the bishop. Pawn takes blocks the bishop. Bishop takes doesn't really threaten anything, because I'll take. Or not. I don't even have to take. I could probably still castle. Very complicated position. I think pawn takes is probably best, if I had to guess. Attack my knight, make me move, probably make me go back. Put my knight on f7, play some defense. But bishop takes is annoying too. I mean, it's, I'm not out of the woods. I'm not out of the woods, you know? Mm-hmm. My original intention was just to take. Um just to take, and then put my knight back on d8. Or knight d4. Knight takes... I mean, if the queen comes in, I, that's not scary. So the real question is, is it scary if the pawn comes in? And the answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, but I don't think so. So I'm going to take the bishop. Yeah, the queen coming in is not scary because I can trade the queen. <laughs> that was my... Big idea. I also can play h6 now. But h6 could be slow. Trading the queen and playing an endgame could be fine. But I can play h6. And then it's just a matter of, like, am I really under attack? 
this might be a bit too bold, but I kind of want to go for it because I don't see what my opponent's going to do to me. Like, I can't play h6. Okay, they just play c3. I mean, playing really fast, right? As always. b4 is a thing, but do I just have a5? Like, obviously, they're trying to go before b5. Can I just play a5 myself? I don't know why I wouldn't. I mean, a5 looks, right? Stop what your opponent wants. They want b4. I don't let them play b4. If they play a3, I play a4. And then they'll never play b4 because I have en passant, which is important to remember. So a5 kind of removes the possibility of long castle if the queens stay on. Because you should understand, if you push pawns where you're going to castle, it's going to be dangerous. But if we, if we had no queens, I could castle anywhere I want. I could leave my king in the center. Like, I'm not getting mated if... Uh, if no queens are on the board. It's a very instructive game, actually. I think I've neutralized my opponent's center very well. Now, I don't know what their plan is. Bishop e3 is a very interesting move. Damaging their own structure, but opening up the rook. Yeah, but my plan was a4, and I am not sure you are bouncing back from that. What is the follow-up to this move? Is the idea to bait me so I really can't castle? Because this looks really restricting for white. This looks really annoying. Not, not being able to really easily play b4 there. Even if they do play b4, nah, I was going to say I could play bishop b6 and leave this here, but like, of course I will take on passant and I'll split your pawns. Okay, they do play this move. They do play this move. <laughs> By the way, now I can justify my A-file a expansion. Um, I guess the plan there was to not let me get an easy life, yeah? The, 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 the whole expansion there. Um... This plan is strong. Yeah. Made me create a weakness and now not letting me easily develop. But you know what? I could just leave my king in the center. I'm going to take because I think I have an advantage in the end game now. And I'm going to play rook f8 and try to play for queen f7. Or do I play rook a5 first? Because queen b5 is an annoying thing. Really don't want to go rook a7. Rook here. Can I trap the queen? If queen b5, rook a5, and then I have king d7, is that crazy talk? Whoa. If the queen gets in here, I might be trapping the queen. Oh, I'm getting... I'm getting really big ideas, and that's generally, that's really, that's really dangerous to give me really big ideas. Oh, man. Let's play rook f8. I'm kind of setting a trap. But I could be miscalculating. <laughs> that's always a possibility. Queen here, rook a5, queen here, and the queen gets trapped. Could that be a reality? King d7. Rook goes, like the idea is rook to b8 trapping the queen. And the queen can't get out. It doesn't have, maybe white has to play b4. I would still play rook b8. Oh, is my opponent's username Impasta? <laughs> That's <laughs> hilarious. But this is a very annoying move. The other thing is I don't have to play rook a5. I could play rook a7. And that defends everything. And then I would, you know, maybe walk my king over. But this is a huge commitment for... What? Whoa. Uh-oh. I can't take that because there's an incoming check and then I'm going to get bulldozed. That's a problem. That move is a problem. I did not see that move. I didn't see that move at all. 
Oof, okay, now we have to adapt to the situation in front of us, and it is not a pretty situation. I mean, my, my, my first idea is to still play Rook A5. Just, I, I have to seize some control back of the game. Rook F8, Queen F8, there's Queen E6. I would play Queen E7, Queen G8. Queen F8, I mean, we might make a draw. I really don't want to make a draw. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think I have a choice. I mean, the alternative is King D7. King D7, Rook F8. I have to be careful of the fork. Rook F1. No, no, no. It's just all bad. It's all bad. It's all bad. I mean, I can long castle. That's basically the only thing I can do. Take Rook, and I still can't play Rook F8. Yeah, I might have to play Rook A5, and we might. I mean, I'm, but I'm, it's still a terrible position. I mean, oh my goodness. Knight e8, rook f1, queen d7. Wow. That's crazy. All right. I'm going for it this way. And I think I'm just going to have to castle queenside. Like, I'm just going to have to chuck some material. Like, I'm probably going to lose that pawn. And I have two and a half minutes. Wow. Whew. Knight is hanging, at least. <laughs> That's, and even though I'm going to lose my pawn on a4, I think in the long run, probably these things are pretty weak. So... That's the only thing that I have going for me. Knight f5, I'm going to put my queen on g5 and try to go for g6. And... I'm sort of hoping that, like, yeah, so now I... But, like, even h4 is a good move. Everything somehow is just working in white's favor here. h4, queen g4. Queen e6, king b8. But, like, it looks horrible. And I'm down three minutes. I mean, this is... Ugh, that first game was, was tough against the... Uh... There's even, like, rook f3 here. Yeah, rook f3. I mean, if my opponent finds all the best moves, I'm going to lose. What can, what can I say? <laughs> Just... Oh, boy. Wait. I think they should go here first. I only calculated rook g3, queen f6, but check here, rook g3. Like I said, if my opponent finds all the best moves, they're going to win the game. What can I say? Oh, man. I am getting outclassed. I'm going to just have to go for those pawns. This is all I can do now. All I can do. I'm going to have to chuck the whole side of the board and pick up these two pawns. And um, I don't know what's happening. I might still be okay, but it's going to become a race. Oh, boy. I wish ChatGPT would just start playing and just start, like, losing all of its pieces. Oof. This is a, this might become a master class on how to defend a worse position against a talented young player. Don't hang your rook. And now it's just a race. I want to say I'm losing the race. I just somehow feel like this, but I have no idea if I'm being completely honest. Okay, I have to take the more impactful pawn. Then I guess I'll take the next pawn too. I mean, I might as well. I don't think I have anything better, right? Like... Running the queen back to help is sort of pointless. Taking all the pawns is probably the way to go. If queen f7 to try to trade my rook, I have no idea if I want the rook trade or not. Like, should I run away? If my opponent plays queen f7 and tries to mate me, do I do anything about it? I don't know. I, I'm completely out of my element. <laughs> but at least I have this pawn, which has survived the game. So I don't know. Oh my goodness. I mean, maybe knight e7. I... <laughs> Feels like knight e7 is wrong. I think this knight is stronger than my knight. But we, we're gonna find out. We are gonna find out. That's, that's chess right there.
We are going to find out who's right. Okay, they do play knight e7. I don't know. It, it seems stupid to allow the knight to go to d5. I don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to take. And now I shouldn't hang my rook. I'm going to put it near my king. And then we're going to just have a race. One, two, three, four, five. Except maybe there will be rook here. And maybe instead of taking the pawn, I play queen b3. So rook g8 is not a thing. H4, queen b3, h5, a3, h6, a2, h7, a1. Yeah. I'm going to try to stop rook g8 by putting my queen on b3 and promoting my own pawn. I'm not going to take the pawn. What does that do? Okay, but it was never my idea to take the pawn. My opponent wanted me not to take the pawn. What's going Are they just panicking? What is happening? I think I'm just back in the driver's seat all of a sudden. Uh-oh. My opponent just... Whoa! Queen trade! What about queen b2? Or queen b1? Queen b1 looks pretty good. Does the rook trade work? Threatening this pawn now. And I'm threatening a2. Rook f2, I can start taking other pawns. This is crazy. I have no clue what's happening. I don't know if I'm winning or losing. Now I think I might be winning, because I'm getting a lot of pawns with attacks. Yeah, they're trying to still mate me, which is not very nice. But I guess I get it. I was trying to mate them too. Oh, man. Uh, queen c... This is stressful. They're trying to play queen a3. C... Six. I'm making a run for it. Making a run for it. Check. King d7. Do I trade the queens? Do I trade the queens and leave my opponent with a pass pawn? Is that what I do? I don't think so. I think I just try to make a cocoon here for my king. I have no idea. Still a pawn down. Should have played faster earlier. Just gotta look for checks. I mean, if, if I don't see a check, I just gotta go. And I'm still trying to win the game myself. Like, I'm looking for a mate, maybe. Let's try to open up that king. I'll go right back. I won't repeat. I'll go right back. Maybe e3. Get a little advancement going. Oh, it's so tough to decide what to do here. Let's just go e3. I mean, let's... I gotta advance. I'm two squares away from queening, right? I gotta, I gotta go for it. King d7. Rook b2. Rook c7, probably. This is, like, really ugly. I'm really unhappy I have to play this move. It's probably not the best move. No, that's bad. This is probably all bad. But my rook is defended, which is at least a good thing. My rook is defended. And my king might just have to go for a run. He might just have to be brave. Oh, this is very big that I'm getting my, 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 pawn, my pawns together like this. Very, very big. King here, rook d7. I'm slowly getting out. Slowly getting out. This is very big for me now. And I'm always looking at this check and this advancement. No checks. No checks. Oh my gosh, that is terrifying. Oh, I hung my rook. I hung my rook. I got low on time. Yeah, my opponent's gonna win. Oh, they're gonna win. Unless... No, King H1. They win. Yep. Well done. Yep, panicked. Got too low on time. Well done. I always make these games unrated, and uh, they should probably be rated games. 
my opponent deserved to uh to get that one. Uh I hope I lost to a child, because if I just lost to an adult, I mean congrats. Very impressive. Um I definitely made a comeback here. And I was uh I was playing for a win, but I just didn't leave myself enough time. Oh, it was good, yeah. And then this was a really nice idea by my opponent right at the end to go for uh to go for this attack. And wow, that is crazy. Wow. D3 was the move. So what should I have played instead? Ah, I should have went rook d8. I should have went... Nope, not rook d8. I should have went here. Allow a check. Oh, and then block. Yep, 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 yep. You know, one thing that's actually interesting for myself is when my opponent played knight h4, oh, it was a brilliant move. <laughs> knight h4 was the only move to get an advantage, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's just equal otherwise. And what's, in, what's instructive is I should have went g5. Had I just played g5, this knight is going nowhere. If I play g5, I probably go on to win the game just because the knight doesn't get any activity. But this wasn't, this was, yeah, that's brutal. That was, and then I spent, wait, I mean, two minutes trying not to, like, lose right away. That's tough. And uh, I played the best way. I defended my king, and, yeah, then I ran headfirst into that. And then, I mean, this is just utter chaos, and black is winning here. <laughs> this is, but I was so pessimistic Wow. It's just winning. Like, this position is winning for black. But I was just so slow. I just, this whole time, I was, I was so negative about my chances. Like, I didn't even take the pawn on c3 for some reason. Why didn't I take the pawn on c3? Yeah, just weird. Weird, weird. I just did a bad job, and um, my opponent did a good job. I mean, they just created counterplay, and... Yeah. How to win at chess, except sometimes we lose to talented young players. So, yeah. I have to, uh, I have to stop playing talented junior players in how to win at chess. I just have to beat up adults. But it's how to win at chess, because at some point, someone's gonna, some, somebody's going to win. So, um, let's put it this way. The Black Gambits got us a very comfortable position, and we were doing actually quite decently in the opening, but sadly we ran into a very, very good opponent, and that's what happens. The previous game, uh, the same exact thing happened, but we managed to outplay. We had that end game. Uh, this one was... Uh... Next episode, the entire, all the games will be played by I Am Pasta, or Impasta. That's all I have for you for episode 28. Wow. Our first defeat in quite a long time. I don't remember the last time that I lost. Um, maybe this uh, puts you off and you will literally uh, never try an opening course again. But I will remind you, uh, Code Spring, 33% off. And um, can't really blame the opening for the loss. Got to blame the player in this case. I'll see you for episode 29. Get out of here.